you know, after you do 20 hour uh, work days during trial for a three month trial, win, lose or draw, you're kind of empty at the end. And I'm trying to find a way to keep my tank full and do the best work I can and be a great dad and be a good member of my family. Welcome to the Tip the Scales podcast, where we discuss running and growing your law firm. I'm your host, Maria Monroy, president and co-founder of LawRank. Today, I am live with Mark Bratt from the Bratt Law Firm. Mark has recovered over $27 million in settlements on his first year, and this is just the beginning. Today, Mark sits down with us to talk about why he left his job at a large firm and how he's found such success in his first year of practice. We dig into the importance of work-life balance, the power of honesty and integrity, and how to push past fear to create a life you love. Mark Bratt. Are how you a doing? brat? Yes. Guilty as charged. You've never heard that joke before, right? No one's ever asked. No, no. Not even back in elementary school. Yeah, you must have gotten bullied just, just from that. Uh, you know, I was the tallest kid, but back then I was the skinniest kid, so, you know... Skinny brat? Uh, skinny brat. Yeah. <laughs> skinny brat. So I heard this rumor that you went, you started your own law firm, and the first year you hit seven figures. Is that true? Yes. Wow. And, Congrats. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I started my firm back in uh, April last year. So I'm not quite at a year. Um, I joined Justice HQ. Don't brag. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, math, right? Um, yes. No, uh, it, it's interesting because I have a lot of friends that, and I'm sorry to interrupt, that want to start a law firm, but I think that they're afraid to. So I think any time they can be exposed to success stories, I think that can be very expanding and motivating. So I'm really intrigued. So tell me a little bit about your background. Okay, so um, I became a lawyer in 06. I went to Pepperdine for uh, law school. That's how I first uh, got to know Bob Simon. Um, and I, my first job was at a firm called Waters and Krauss, which uh, they did asbestos mesothelioma cases, and I clerked there, loved the, you know, the work environment, um, had great mentorship, and worked there for about five years, uh, at which point I took a job at, uh, with Mark Lanier. Oh, wow. And you was worked working for with Mark, Mark Lanier? Yeah, yeah. How cool. What was that like? It was amazing. Uh, you know, Mark is, you know, if not the greatest, one of the greatest trial lawyers uh, of all time, uh, certainly of this generation. Um, and having the opportunity to legitimately learn from him directly, uh, I was able to try a case along with him, or at least be on his trial team uh, in Texas. That was a, you know, Phenomenal experience just to be able to, uh, you know, take some of the things that he does, not just in the courtroom, but also in working up cases and working with clients and uh, preparation and then putting it into my own, um, you know, my own career. Uh, so I was uh, lucky enough to start trying cases uh, when I was working for his firm. And he believed in me and gave me That's a chance. Amazing. And it was really cool. So um, I never sit in at conferences. Mm hmm But I've sat in on Mark Lanier's. Not the whole thing, but he does this thing on persuasion. And I was like, wow, even his slides are amazing. Yeah, uh, that, it, it, he, he can actually uh, build slides in the middle of a courtroom in front of a jury. Uh, like, you know, I, I can't do that. And watching him do that and uh, use it to help persuade and tell a story um, was, is, was really inspiring. And while I've learned a few techniques, I'm still, I, don't, I still don't have the guts to, to do it in front of a jury. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Mark uh, taught me a ton, um, and uh, then I was lucky enough to take a job at a firm called Weitz & Luxembourg. They're based in New York, but they Wait, have a national really? presence. Yeah. That's crazy. They're one of the biggest mass tort firms in the country, no? Yeah, so, I mean, they do a lot of stuff. Uh, I would say that from a mass tort angle, yes, they handle medical device cases and, I mean, everything, really. Um, but they have a huge mesothelioma asbestos practice. They do. You know what's crazy? I was on a plane the other day and I saw their commercial. Oh, yeah. I mean, they advertise all over, I think. I mean, I don't see them much out here uh, in California, but they certainly do, you know, on the East Coast and yeah. nationally. So, um, but they have a satellite office in uh, L.A., and uh, a good friend of mine from law school, his name's Benno Ashrafi. He and I uh, worked together at Waters and Krauss. Then he went to Whites and Luxembourg when I went to uh, the Lanier Law Firm. And then we came back and started working together at um, Whites and Luxembourg. And that was about seven years ago, like 2015 timeframe. 
So um, I started trying cases full time as kind of the lead trial lawyer out of the LA office, and uh, you know was lucky enough to have some great cases and some uh, you know great clients and build amazing relationships with them. Um, and then you know they entrusted me along with the firm to try their cases, and uh, with that experience, you know I lucky enough to hit several verdicts and uh, just really love you know being in the courtroom, spending time working up the case from start to finish and, and getting to know my clients. I mean, at the end of the day, for me, um, building relationships with people, um, be it my coworkers or uh, the clients I'm representing, is far and away the, the top priority for me. Um, I, I don't think you can do a good job representing people in a courtroom if you don't truly get to know them. And that requires you spend a lot of time with them. So what made you start your own firm? Well, um, after working with uh, some great law firms and learning from them, um, I just started thinking about a life-work balance aspect of things. I have a six-and-a-half-year-old daughter named Luna, and she's literally the light of my life. And I um, wanted to be able to still continue to represent people and try cases, but also drop her off at school every day. And so here I am. I'm a member of the PTA, but I'm also running a law firm that uh, in its first year we've had some good success. That's amazing. So what was what did that look like, taking that first step forward? So I was scared. Uh, I, I think anyone that's going out on their own, um, if they say they weren't scared, I don't, I'm not sure how honest they're being. They're um, I was really scared. You're I was scared. nervous. I had mortgage. I had a, you know, a, a child I, to support, a family to support. And, um, and I was making good, uh, you know, I was being paid very well. Um, and so this comfortable you know, making a salary and uh, having, you know, your ability to pay your mortgage, like, it's tough to break away from that. Um, but, I, you know, I talked to Bob a lot, and he's like, man, you've had some really great success in the courtroom. You'd be great on your own. You should, uh, you should do it. And I've got this great opportunity with Justice HQ. Uh, and so I was, I was like, all right, I'll do it. So I just, I gave notice uh, with uh, the folks at Whites and Luxembourg at the beginning of last year. And started my firm, and we officially launched April 1st. Were you able to bring cases with you? No, I didn't want to. I mean, the reality is, you know, I, I respect them as a, a you know, law firm. And, and while I had great relationships with clients, I wanted to maintain a good business relationship with them. And so I went with no cases, uh, and I uh, just figured if I continue working hard, good things will happen, and, and they have. So... That's amazing, and I've never heard of someone leaving a firm that didn't take cases with them. I was nervous, uh, but within the first month, I got a call from uh, a son of someone who had mesothelioma, which is an asbestos-related cancer, and we spoke on the phone for you know an hour. Uh, I ended up speaking to his mom and his dad, um, who, who, who's the one that was sick, and I signed the case, and then I partnered with another firm uh, up in the Bay Area um, that does great work, Kays and McLean, and um, you know that that first case that I got. It was before I had a website, before I had um, malpractice insurance, but um, you know I knew that <laughs> how did you it was going to go well, huh? How did they? How did you get the keys? Uh, just people hearing that I've done good work. I mean, it literally word of mouth. I, I you know I'm not much for marketing, and, and I'm probably silly for that. I, I don't really have a social media presence. Um, Yes, I built a website, but um, but at the end of the day, it's all about relationships, people I've uh, tried to help in the past that you know return the favor. And I feel like if you put good stuff out there, if you're um, if you try to help people legitimately from a place of trying to improve their lives, be it a you know a client that you're working with or a fellow lawyer, then good things will come back to you. That's amazing. And we didn't um, we're going so quickly, but I wanted to kind of go back to. Bob's Bob is a mentor. He's yeah. like he's so amazing. Uh, listen, Bob is a great trial lawyer. Number one, a good person. Number two, yes, he and he's built, you know, not just a successful law firm, but this Justice HQ is just an amazing um, new way of practicing law. Aren't you the member of the month? Uh, yes, they <laughs> surprised me with that uh, esteemed honor uh, yesterday, actually, I just learned. Um, I, I think the bar is pretty low, but uh, yeah, no, I'm the member of the month for March, so that, it was pretty cool. That's awesome. So what has this year been like for you, and like, what have been your biggest challenges? 
Um, you know, when you go out on your own, uh, on one hand, you're like, all right, I'm a trial lawyer. I know what I'm doing in the courtroom. But then you have to figure out all the other aspects of running a business. And yep. that, I think, was the most uh, nerve-wracking thing. Um, you know, from building uh, a website to who do I call to get malpractice insurance, IT issues, uh, right. to do I need business cards uh, in this modern age, um, to uh, marketing. And, and, you know, I'm still figuring it out, uh, candidly. Um, but the one thing that I keep coming back to is um, trying to just help out people. Um, so helping out fellow lawyers within Justice HQ. I got a call from someone I've never done work with and spent an hour on the phone explaining what asbestos was just the other day to try to help her help her client. And, you know, there's no, there was no financial interest in, in that for me. That was just me trying to, you know, uh, make our little legal world a better place. Uh, because, you know, I, I think if you're out there trying to make a difference uh, in general, and I can help you do that, then that by extension, you know, I'm helping everyone. I love that. But going back to the business side of things, because, I mean, you went to two great schools and I would be willing to bet that you didn't learn much about running a business. Zero. I mean, they, they don't... Pepperdine was a great law school experience for me. Um, however, I didn't learn anything about running a business there. Um, and that's not to say it's Pepperdine's fault. I just think law schools, at least back when in the early 2000s when I was, uh, you know, there... That, that's not a focus. They don't give, give you that class. Um, and so I certainly um, have had to learn on the fly and learn from my mistakes and learn from others, finding mentors like Bob and, and other people that have started their firms successfully to figure out what to do uh, because I didn't naturally know it. So what are you doing? Well, at the end of the day, um, I take a... Um, uh, a justice-led, heart-driven approach to everything I do. I mean, that's kind of my tagline on my website. But every single person that I talk to, I figure out if I can help them directly. I take a very small caseload so I can have my hands in every single case that uh, comes in the door. And I, and I frankly have taught myself to say no, uh, which is a weird thing if you're trying to build a business and trying to um, you know, make money and uh, feed your family. I say no all the time. Well, naturally, uh, I think... Prior to me going on my own, I said yes far too much. And I spread myself way too thin. So um, boundaries. So setting boundaries uh, appropriately that allow you to do other things in your life that you need to do. Uh, you know, like work out a couple times a week if you can. Spend time with your family. Um, you know, I think uh, the early part of my career was so focused on winning trials. And, uh, and that was great. But... You know, after you do 20-hour uh, work days during trial for a three-month trial, win, lose, or draw, you're kind of empty at the end. And I'm trying to find a way to keep my tank full and do the best work I can and be a great dad and be a good member of my family. But I think taking care of your health, like you mentioned working out, spending time with your family will actually make you a better business owner and a better lawyer. I agree, 100%. 100%. Because it's really a holistic approach and different areas of our lives I think they spill over they, they impact us right like if you're not healthy how could you be the best lawyer that you can be or the best business owner now is it just you right now or have you started hiring people I am still the only employee I joke with my wife that she she's uh, she speaks Spanish so she's my interpreter um, and when and when she gets hired she'll be highly paid at this point it's just me and uh, for now that's the right decision. Uh, I've talked to pe people, including Bob and, and, and others, about scaling and hiring people so I can free up myself to do um, you know, the most important things. But right now, the most important thing for me is to have a hand in all the cases that I'm, I'm working on. How many cases do you have right now? Right now, um, I just got another asbestos mesothelioma case, which I'm you know, excited to represent the family on. Um, and then I have a, a big employment case uh, with about 15 plaintiffs that we're suing. Uh, the largest uh, shipping company in the world. Um, and I also have a, a trip and fall case. And then I have a few smaller ones that um, figuring out what to do, whether I refer them out to another lawyer or keep them. But I mean, less than less than 10. Wow. But these are all more serious, bigger cases, I'd argue. Yeah. I mean, it's not to say I, I, I don't want to help out people that have uh, you know less serious injuries, but most of the cases I handle uh, are toxic exposure cases where they have terminal cancer, 
or have you know significantly been discriminated in the workplace uh, or have uh, you know, life-altering injuries after a trip and fall or an accident. Uh, I generally uh, will focus on that, um, but, but again, if anyone calls me, I'm gonna try to help them. And if it's not me taking the case, I will find the best attorney that can help them. I mean, that's my goal every single time I uh, answer the phone. Now, when and if you do hire someone, what would be your first hire? Uh, probably the most amazing experienced paralegal that is just a good person. Um, someone that is both trustworthy and honest and a hard worker, but also has other things going on in their life that um, make them a happy person, fun to be around. Interesting. So there's like this whole theme with you about like a holistic approach to life and business yeah I, I mean you can make all the money in the world and fly around in a private jet but does that make you happy for me waking up every day and dropping my daughter off uh, she's a first grader at school and giving her a kiss and then going off and trying to help people deal with you know bad things that have happened to them that's a good day and but at the end of the day you come home and and you know sometimes cook dinner or, or you know just have dinner with the family at home I don't know if you can beat that day, um, but sometimes if you're in trial for four, to four or five times a year for three months at a time, you can't get that full holistic experience. So you gotta, you gotta set boundaries. I used to work at AT&T and here in LA, and I texted an old employee of mine, and we were texting back and forth yesterday, and he's 32 years old, and I was like, how's life? He's like, well, I only work. I want to retire by 40. I have no friends, no girlfriend, no social life. And I was like, all right, we need to have breakfast on Saturday because that is just what's the point of being wealthy if you don't have someone to share that with, if you don't have a life, like, I'm just like legitimately worried. I'm like, I know I haven't seen him in 10 years, but I'm like, hey, dude, like that is, yeah, no, like you have it backwards. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, you know, if, if your whole life is work and that's how you're defined and you don't have other outlets, whether it's a musical instrument or, um, you know, cooking or um, traveling, you're, you're really going to lose yourself to your, your job. And, you know, I, Listen, the pandemic has taught us all a lot, um, yes. and I, I certainly took away from it um, the importance of slowing things down, setting boundaries, and spending quality time with the people in your life that love you and you want to give that love in return. I mean, that's, I, I think if you don't have those things, then it can be a pretty empty existence, and that's certainly not one I wanted to, uh, or that I want to live or wanted to continue uh, you know, feeding. Do you know Joe Freed? I don't. So he's a trucking, he's the trucking lawyer in the country. And I just had him on, on the podcast and he talked about that, like how he is working on, I'm going to, not going to do this justice. I'm sorry, Joe, but basically like he's defined himself through being this, you know, big trial lawyer and like that worries him. Right. And like how we shouldn't be defining ourselves by what we do how detrimental that can be. But he's very, he has so much awareness, right? Mm -hmm. He's like trying to um, work on that. And it's interesting talking to you because I de I'm totally a workaholic and I know that I'm avoiding something. Like that's like what keeps me kind of going. The busyness is because I'm trying to avoid whatever it is. I, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But it's like this idea of balance and like kind of calmness that I think COVID did bring and I know COVID brought a lot of bad, and I get that, and I'm not trying to be insensitive um, to all the bad that COVID brought. But COVID did that for me, too. Like, it forced me to slow down, to cook dinner, to spend time with my kids, to be more present, especially when, like, especially, like, in San Diego and here in L.A., everything was shut down. Like, I couldn't take my kids to the park. Right. Yeah. Right? And I think of it fondly and I remember there was a, a point in time like three months in where I swore it was going to be over soon I was like I can't have COVID end and I didn't do something productive like a big life change for me the big life change was working out like mm -hmm. I'd never worked out my whole life and then I created that habit and during the initial 
I guess they were still initial months, although I swore it was like over, right? Which it right. still isn't. It's a blur still, right? It is. It's all <laughs> kind of like bleeds in and like it just blends in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's definitely, it's interesting you're saying all this to me because it resonates for me, but I'm not, I wish I could apply it more, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, for the first 10 years of my career, I defined myself with this goal of becoming a trial lawyer. And that's how I identified. That's how, I, you know, if I was talking with someone, uh, it was always this, I'm so busy, I got these trials. And it was true, but you start realizing that if you're only defined in one way, it's pretty limiting. Um, and and it's, I don't think it's the healthiest approach it's mentally. It's not healthy. It, it's absolutely not healthy. I'll be the first to admit that this is not healthy. Um, how did you break it, though? Like, what was it? Was it having your daughter that did this or... COVID, like, what was that moment where you're like, oh, shit, I got to change this? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it was a combination. I, you know, yes, the, the, the kind of this forced isolation we were in, uh, the, the, t- the added time you were spending with your family. I mean, pre-COVID, I was spending probably more time with my, my work friends, the people I worked with at the office and in trial, than I was, you know, my family. Um, and so when all of a sudden we're, it's, it's totally flipped on its head, uh, I realized like, man, this is, this is great. Uh, all this extra time. And, uh, I was doing art projects and, um, you know, teaching science and math. And, and, and I, I just wanted to structure my life, uh, start my own firm and find a way to have both. And, and yes, I've been lucky in this first year. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, those that encourage me to do it, um, I, I've been able to find that balance, set those boundaries, and have some success. That, that's amazing. It's funny because I know a lot of couples got divorced due to COVID, but for me, that time when everything was shut down, we, I don't think my husband and I fought once. It was like the most calm time in our household. And it's funny because I'm just like re-realizing that. I know at some point I had realized like, wait a minute, why aren't we fighting? Because there were no outside stressors. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's like, now it's like, again, it's like, we're we're so busy, you know, and I'm again in that, I feel like I'm in a hamster wheel Mm -hmm. and I'm traveling every other week basically. And it's like so much. And my goal this year is like, it's health. And part of that is, can I find more balance and calmness and like, being like in the in the flow of life like not fighting yeah. whatever happens right like I, I got stuck in traffic yesterday and there was like an accident or something and it literally wasn't moving and I was driving from Vegas here and I was like okay I'm not even gonna get mad <laughs> I have nowhere to be right now I'm not gonna get frustrated like I'm not gonna fight it you mm-hmm. know so I'm definitely working on that and I'd like to find that within the whole you know the business yeah I you know the funny thing is as lawyers, you want to control what you can. I mean, well, human nature is... I want to control, control. everything. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and I've realized there's so much that is not in my control. Um, the things that I can control, which are the things I say yes to and commit to and follow through on, those are things I'm going all in on. But I'm also doing that with the goal of being able to say yes to, you know, planning the movie night for my daughter's PTA. <laughs> But I think a lot of lawyers think if I go off on my own, it's going to be more work. It can be, uh, you, but you've also got to prioritize how you're working. Uh, I've, I certainly have learned in this first year to work a lot smarter. And sometimes that is saying no to cases. Sometimes that's realizing, and I, I've used this analogy with young lawyers as I kind of uh, talk to them about, you know, going out on their own or, or you know, starting their own practice, is, you know, I'm good at, certain things and I'm really, you know, focused on certain cases, but there are other cases that come in and I'm like, I don't know anything about this. The best thing for those clients are for me to uh, acknowledge that and then find the best lawyer that's going to help them. And even if that means I'm not taking a referral fee on it, but it's best for the client, I'm going to do that, you know, 10 times out of 10. Because uh, number one, that same lawyer may send me a case in the future uh, and may not even expect a referral fee. But um, it's all about doing exactly what I would hope is done for my own family. Uh, you know, if my mom or dad or my grandparents were in an accident, I want them to find a really 
compassionate lawyer that's going to help them. And I hope to do that, uh, even if it means not taking the case and giving it to a, a lawyer that's better suited to do so. I think a lot of lawyers say this, but I actually believe you. The only reason people believe you is if you are an honest person. And, and I don't think so. Some people have a really bad, like, what's the right word? Like a bullshit meter. You're right. But I think in the long game of life, um, I can't go and talk to a jury and ask them for tens of millions of dollars for my client if I'm lying through my teeth. And honesty and transparency in business, honesty and transparency in the courtroom, honesty and transparency with my clients themselves, telling them the, the, the tough truths about why their case may not have the best result, sometimes that's going to be way better than just trying to fake it. And uh, again, I, I, I want to look uh, a jury in the eye and say, yes, my, you know, the case has these problems, but it's still worth an incredible amount of money. Uh, we got to get justice, and that's the only way to do it, despite the fact my clients made some mistakes. You, you can't lie about those things. you got to own them. You got to listen to Joe Fried. He's going to resonate with you so much. I'm going to send you the episode. I will. I'll listen to it. No, he's like, not, he's like all about being vulnerable with the jury mm-hmm. and he explains how he does it and like utilizing energy. It's really like some, I've never heard of anything like that, the way he describes it. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you walk through life thinking that you've got it all figured out and you're not showing vulnerability with your clients, with your, your friends, with your family, with juries, um, you're going to lose uh, because we are inherently vulnerable humans. No one's infallible. Uh, you can't walk around and just be the tough guy and the person that's always right all the time. You got to know when you're, when you got to learn. And I'm constantly learning and I'd love to learn from, from Joe and, and uh, you meet, meet him probably. And, but also, le- you know, listen to the podcast. No, he's, he has like a cult following. <laughs> It's, it's he's like famous I'm so, like what I'll send it to you and you'll, you'll see that's great yeah. it's probably because I'm in a hole you're in I, a different space I'm, he's, uh, well, he's PI yeah well I'm, and, and that's the thing part of also why I went out on my own is to expand I, I've been doing asbestos mesothelioma and talc trials for 15 plus years and it's it's been great I've learned really complex litigation high stress you know my trials again sometimes for two three months you know yeah, that's it, crazy and so I, I was longing to try a case that might be just five days and, and, you know, a legitimate case with legitimate injuries. But I'm like, well, maybe a five-day trial might, you know, might be a little healthier from a balance standpoint than always constantly doing these three-month trials. And you listen to that longing, that inner voice. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. think it's important to, and it's obviously a rhetorical question, but do you think it's important to listen to that inner voice that we have? Yes, I've talked about going out on my own for years and I ignored that voice because I also listened to the voice of fear. You have to balance it all. You have to fight through that fear. And one of the big reasons I chose to start my own firm was so I could look my daughter in the eye when she's a little older and say, bet on yourself. If you work hard, you treat people right, good things will happen. And um, how could I legitimately do that? You know, as she's uh, heading into adulthood and, you know, uh, 10, 12 years from now, if I didn't do it myself. That's beautiful. And I, I get it. I have kids. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. I re- thanks for having me. This is cool, fun. I've, have, I've done this literally the, for the first time with Bob just the other day. So <laughs> it's my second podcast. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to Mark Bratt for everything he shared today. If you found this story valuable, please share it with someone you want to see succeed and subscribe so you never miss an episode. 